Redden your hands with human blood. Blast by slander the fair fame of the innocent. Strangle the smiling child upon its mother's knees. Deceive, ruin, and desert the beautiful girl who loves and trusts you, and your case is not hopeless. For all this and for all these, you may be forgiven. For all this and for all these, that bankrupt court established by the gospel will give you a discharge. But deny the existence of these divine ghosts, of these gods, and the sweet and tearful face of mercy becomes livid with eternal hate. Heaven's golden gates are shut, and you, with an infinite curse ringing in your ears, with the brand of infamy upon your brow, commence your endless wanderings in the lurid gloom of hell, an immortal vagrant an eternal outcast, a deathless convict. One of these gods, and one who demands our love, our admiration, and our worship, and one who is worshipped, if mere heartless ceremony is worship, gave to his chosen people for their guidance the following laws of war. When thou comest nigh unto a city to fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be, if it make thee answer of peace, and open unto thee, then it shall be that all people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. And if it will make no peace with thee, but will make war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. And when the Lord thy God hath delivered it into thine hands, thou shalt smite every male thereof with the edge of the sword. But the women, and the little ones, and the cattle, and all that is in the city, even all the spoil thereof, shalt thou take unto thyself, and thou shalt eat the spoil of thine enemies, which the Lord thy God hath given thee. Thus shalt thou do unto all the cities which are very far off from thee, which are not of the cities of these nations, but of the cities of these people which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, Thou shalt save alive nothing that breatheth. Is it possible for man to conceive of anything more perfectly infamous? Can you believe that such directions were given by any except an infinite fiend? Remember that the army receiving these instructions was one of invasion. Peace was offered on condition that the people submitting should be the slaves of the invader. But if any should have the courage to defend their home, to fight for the love of wife and child, then the sword was to spare none, not even the prattling, dimpled babe. And we are called upon to worship such a God, to get upon our knees and tell him that he is good, that he is merciful that he is just, that he is love. We are asked to stifle every noble sentiment of the soul and to trample underfoot all the sweet charities of the heart. Because we refuse to stultify ourselves, refuse to become liars, we are denounced, hated, traduced, and ostracized here, and this same God threatens to torment us in eternal fire the moment death allows him to fiercely clutch our naked, helpless souls. Let the people hate. Let the God threaten. We will educate them, and we will despise and defy him. The book called the Bible is filled with passages equally horrible, unjust, and atrocious. This is the book to read in schools in order to make our children loving, kind, and gentle. This is the book recognized in our Constitution as the source of authority and justice. Strange that no one has ever been persecuted by the Church for believing God bad, while hundreds of millions have been destroyed for thinking Him good. The Orthodox Church will never forgive the Universalist for saying, God is love. It has always been considered as one of the very highest evidence of true and undefiled religion to insist that all men, women, and children deserve eternal damnation. It has always been heresy to say, God will at last save all.
we are asked to justify these frightful passages, these infamous laws of war, because the Bible is the word of God. As a matter of fact, there never was, and there never can be, an argument even tending to prove the inspiration of any book whatever. In the absence of positive evidence, analogy, and experience, argument is simply impossible, and at the very best can only amount to a useless agitation of the air. The instant we admit that a book is too sacred to be doubted, or even reasoned about, we are mental serfs. It is infinitely absurd to suppose that a god would address a communication to intelligent beings, and yet make it a crime to be punished in eternal flames for them to use their intelligence for the purpose of understanding his communication. If we have the right to use our reason, we certainly have the right to act in accordance with it, and no god can have the right to punish us for such action. The doctrine that future happiness depends upon belief is monstrous. It is the infamy of infamies. The notion that faith in Christ is to be rewarded by an eternity of bliss, while a dependence upon reason, observation, and experience merits everlasting pain, is too absurd for refutation, and can be relieved only by that unhappy mixture of insanity and ignorance called faith. What man, whoever thinks, can believe that blood can appease God? And yet our entire system of religion is based upon that belief. The Jews pacified Jehovah with the blood of animals, and, according to the Christian system, the blood of Jesus softened the heart of God a little, and rendered possible the salvation of a fortunate few. It is hard to conceive how the human mind can give assent to such terrible ideas, or how any sane man can read the Bible and still believe in the doctrine of inspiration. Whether the Bible is true or false is of no consequence in comparison with the mental freedom of the race. Salvation through slavery is worthless. Salvation from slavery is inestimable. As long as man believes the Bible to be infallible, that is his master. The civilization of this century is not the child of faith, but of unbelief, the result of free thought. All that is necessary, as it seems to me, to convince any reasonable person that the Bible is simply and purely of human invention, of barbarian invention, is to read it. Read it as you would any other book. Think of it as you would any other. Get the bandage of reverence from your eyes. Drive from your heart the phantom of fear. Push from the throne of your brain the cowled form of superstition. Then read the Holy Bible, and you will be amazed that you ever, for one moment, supposed a being of infinite wisdom goodness and purity to be the author of such ignorance and of such atrocity. Our ancestors not only had their god factories, but they made devils as well. These devils were generally disgraced and fallen gods. Some had headed unsuccessful revolts. Some had been caught sweetly reclining in the shadowy folds of some fleecy clouds, kissing the wife of the god of gods. These devils generally sympathized with man. There is in regard to them a most wonderful fact. In nearly all the theologies, mythologic and religious, the devils have been much more humane and merciful than the gods. No devil ever gave one of his generals an order to kill children and to rip open the bodies of pregnant women. Such barbarities were always ordered by the good gods. The pestilences were sent by the most merciful gods. The frightful famine, during which the dying child with pallid lips sucked the withered bosom of a dead mother, was sent by the loving gods. No devil was ever charged with such fiendish brutality.